pleasure to introduce to you today Paul de Laguilapla, who is a research staff scientist at the CIBM Signal Processing EPFL Mathematical Imaging Section and the postdoctoral researcher and the Biomedical Imaging Group, which is headed by Professor Michael Unzer here at EPFL. And um, Paul has been with us for a few years now, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about his work on stability of image reconstruction algorithms. Thank you, Paul. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, indeed, I'm gonna talk about uh, when you design a machine, do you think that uh, you're gonna get images out of it, but you don't, you get some measurement and then you rely on software to provide an image. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that step, which is the step we work on most, and specifically about how much can you trust that step and how that has changed across the history of image reconstruction. Uh, so I'll start with some content that might be familiar to you if you've heard the talk by our section before, which is how to interpret image reconstruction as, a, as an inverse problem. Uh, then I'll, I'll proceed into the topic of stability by giving you a view of the history, how it improved and improved, but maybe how we lost this property of stability along the way. Uh, meaning that maybe now the most modern image reconstruction methods, which work really, really well, maybe they're not so robust to small uncertainties in the measurements. So let's start with imaging as an inverse problem. <clears throat> we have this unified way of viewing inverse problems in, in the group where we say, okay, you have uh, some quantity uh, S, that it lives in a continuum, right? So it's it's a real uh, life quantity. It's not a matrix inside the computer. Uh, and that is what you're actually interested in. It's a continuous domain thing in space, in time, that you would like to see. But then inside the computer, you're gonna represent it as, as a finite dimensional array, a set of numbers that hopefully resemble what you wanna what you wanna represent. Then you can sort of model the instrumentation, most of the uh, imaging modalities in medical imaging, you can model them as some process or instrument physics that tends to be linear. That's because that's what you aim when you design such machines, to have a linear relationship between what you measure and what you wanna know. And then there's some statistical variability that often we can assume that it, it is some additive noise that uh, gets there into the measurement. So the approximations here is, okay, approximately this noise or uh, random variation is additive. And then uh, in any interesting setup, you will have that this is an ill post inverse problem. That means that you could have many different S's that would lead to the same measurement. So you have to choose which one do you prefer as an explanation for your measurement. So this is a, an uncomfortable truth that often when you maybe design the instruments, uh, you think, okay, if, if I do my MRI machine and I, I just keep adding case space, in the end, that doesn't happen. But in practice, when you run it, you never sample enough and, and you're often in this regime in which there's an algorithm that has to choose among equally viable candidates. <clears throat> so as an example, PET, you have there, uh, some nuclear reactions happening inside the brain at some rate over time. You put the patient in the scanner and that gives you sinograms. So it's not obvious to go from there to there. It's the job of the image reconstruction and the, the, whole, uh, the whole motivation of the talk is, okay, this is a, a choice that someone has to make. Uh, so algorithms have an important role. Um, so just to, to give a, a bit of the the mathematical setup for this. We have this object in continuum, this S that depends on X, Y, Z, T, whatever variables uh, can be higher dimensional. Um, we usually assume that it was finite energy signal. Uh, and then you have some kind of measurement operator that takes this S and turns it into a finite set of numbers that tells you these are the measurements that what you get out of the machine. Uh, 
because of the linearity assumption, which again, when you design a system, you really want to have linearity. We know that this can be like any system can be characterized in this very easy form. So basically the measurements are going to be a linear, uh, each measurement is going to be a linear uh, function of the continuous thing that we want to observe. And therefore we will have these little functions there, eta sub m, that are called analysis functions. So if you give me an instrument, I want from it the analysis functions because that helps me characterize what that instrument is doing. Uh, so then you study whatever physics you need for the specific uh, application setting. And there, those physics basically help you to get this eta sub m. So this is a beautiful abstraction that we have in image reconstruction is, okay, put the physics, solve them, and then they'll give you the eta sub m. And then we treat everything the same way after that. So the example of MRI, I won't pretend to explain MRI today here because I don't know. <laughs> Probably some of you should come and explain it. But uh, the, my basic point is that you can see it as a, one of these linear devices that simply has the analysis functions equals to the complex sinusoid. And that is what, what the physics have boiled down to as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and then even you can extend this model with coil sensitivity by simply adding to this analysis function, simply a, a weight function that, that characterizes the sensitivity of the coils. Okay, so how general is this that I just presented? Well, pretty general. So these are all the different modalities that we easily know how to explain uh, using this, this setup. So simply here, again, this is a reminder. This is like the formula for a single measurement depends on this analysis function. And then you have for the different modalities, how that boils down. Uh, like, so you can cover tomography where you have here basically something indicating a specific rate. Uh, the convolution microscopy, which is more biological imaging, but again, you can put the same image reconstruction framework into it. Into it. Then more complex bi biological uh, imaging setups, but also PET, which is in the end, mathematically, it's very, very similar to, to any other tomography. Uh, MRI we discussed, cardiac MRI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then everything I'm just telling you is how to characterize this H, right? So how to represent mathematically what the instrument does. But I'm missing one step. Because I told you what, what I want to recover is a continuous domain thing, but I can't do that inside the computer. So there's another choice I have yet to make. So the, the first choice was simplifying the physics down to these analysis functions, which there you can do it cleanly. The second choice is, okay, how will I represent this continuous domain thing in my computer, which has finite memory, finite space. I, I need to choose a model for what I want to reconstruct. So this is what we call discretization, which is, okay, actually the signal I'm gonna recover is finite dimensional because I can't do better than that. Uh, and here basically we express the signal as a sum of coefficients accompanying basis functions. So that's the expression there. Here is an example, if you haven't seen this before, on the right hand side, you have a parabola fitted with linear interpolation, which can be seen as the same thing. Like you get a bunch of triangles and you add them up uh, to create a very good approximation of the problem. So what's cool then is that you can plug in that, that formula that, that tells you, okay, the continuous signal you want is a sum of coefficients time basis functions. And you can plug it in in the formula for the measurement. And you see that everything boils down to a sum over these inner problems between uh, the analysis functions and what we will call the synthesis functions, which is the basis functions you use to represent the unknown quantity. So that's where actually the, the little equation we started from comes. So you have the measurements, 
are some kind of matrix times a vector of coefficients of the signal plus some random variation. Uh, and again, we've, we've derived that this is the case if you represent the signal in terms of basis functions and uh, you have analysis functions. So basically the operator is linear, the measurement operator is linear. So that's the basic setup of any inverse problem algorithm. Uh, how, how to choose the discretization? So there are certain choices that are usually made for simplifying the computation. So you would likely, or even for, for coherence, right? So you would like shift invariant representations. There's no reason why you should represent something here on the left or here on the right differently. So shift invariant means this. Uh, separable generator, this is something to heavily speed uh, computations because typically higher dimensional things, uh, if you want to grid it up, it can become very complex if, if you do that jointly in the two dimensions. So it's better to have like uniform stuff that is independent one dimension from the other. Um, and then there are several models. You could do a pixelated model. So basically assume that this continuous thing you're trying to represent is piecewise constant. You can do a bilinear model. So basically these triangles I was showing in the example, which is between any two points in this continuous that we want to recover, you have a, like a, a line or a plane, or you can do more complicated stuff, unlimited representation. This is one of the classical uh, representations in signal processing, but it's, it's a bit harder. You, you think in the frequency domain and you think, okay, the signal that I want to recover is finite bandwidth. Anyway, so with that in hand, uh, an extremely brief history of image reconstruction, uh, like two slides brief. I have a 40 minute tutorial that you can check out. And then there's a three hour and a half tutorial by Mikkel and myself, uh, which then has all the content. So this is like the condensed of the condensed, okay? Uh, so there's, we divide image reconstruction in three generations. Uh, here represented by first Swiss watches, like first the concept of a Swiss watch, the, no, a Swiss watch, then the concept of the machine underlying, and at some point we evolved into like some uh, kind of brain that, that seems to think by itself. Um, it's just pictorial, <laughs> don't give it more meaning than that. Um, and we divide it in these three generations because basically the switch from first to second generation and from second to third, represent increases in performance of the image reconstruction algorithms that are corresponding to each other. So uh, the only thing is that this took like a century, the first step from classical to uh, sparse city-based image reconstruction took <laughs> a while, like, okay, 20, 30 years. But then the second step was much accelerated by the uh, deep learning, uh, machine learning. Anyway, extremely brief summary again. Uh, the main idea, if you have this kind of model, y equals hs plus n, so it's basically my measurements would be hs if the world was perfect, but I have some random variability, would be okay. I'm going to try to find the s tilde that is that when I model my instrument with this h matrix, is going to be as close as possible to my measurements. That is extremely naive and it won't work in interesting problems, because as I told you at the beginning, interesting problems are ill-posed, which means that there are several S's that will be equally close to Y when passed through H. So it's I need some extra information. That is not going to be information enough for me to choose a single S. So I need to put some kind of prior information on what I'm trying to see so that uh, the algorithm will succeed. So. This is like the, the classical uh, regularization, which is okay. I'm going to add something here that I want it to be small, but I'm going to do that in a smooth manner. So I have like a square term on something like a transformation of the, of the signal coefficients. And I will want this term to be small too. And Lambda will, will judge the compromise be between how faithful I am to the measurements and how uh, how small this regularization quantity is. This can be motivated from several fields, like it can be seen from a more um, 
purely approximation or inverse problem setting. It can also be seen from a statistical uh, perspective. Both agree, and that's why we have the two heads there, uh, two different people that develop theories that led to the same thing. Um, then this, this introduces the concept of this L matrix. So it's some transform of S that you want to be small. So for example, if you're trying to, to recover a smooth a volume, a smooth signal, then you would put this L to be some sort of gradient or derivative operator. So you would want the changes between adjacent pixels to be small. So this would be one way of doing it. Uh, this can be seen as filtered back projection uh, for those uh, domains that are accustomed to this term, because basically what you, this has a closed form solution. So if, if we have this optimization problem, we can solve it in one step. If this was manageable, in fact, that, that is usually very expensive. But anyway, you can do recursive solutions that get there anyway. And what you see here is that you first go through the back projection, so the, the transpose of the operator, and then you, you have some kind of filtering, linear filtering of that to get rid of uh, unwanted noise. This, the failure of this approach is that if you take it like just the least square setup, it will amplify noise heavily and it has a very undetermined solution because of what I told you, like there are several lessons. And if you do that one here in Lambda, you have a parameter that actually will, will let you choose between having a noisy reconstruction and a smooth reconstruction, typically. So it will be hard to find a value of the parameter lambda in which you're satisfied because sometimes you'll say, oh, to blurry, to blurry, to blurry, and at some point it's gonna to noisy, to noisy. So you'll have to choose somewhere in between. And for a while, that was the best we knew how to do. Enter sparsity-based reconstruction methods. So you keep the same structure of the, of the problem, uh, like here, but you say, okay, I'm gonna generalize this a bit and put some other function. And in practice, it becomes this one norm instead of the two norm. Why? Uh, okay, without getting in too much into details, uh, basically the concept is, can I choose a different transform before we set the, the gradient? Uh, but anyway, can I choose any different transform such that when I transform S, it has, it's sparse. It has very few coefficients that are not zero. That is the, the first concept. The second concept is that there's some theory known as compress sensing that tells you that when you're in this setup and upon some very nice conditions on this A matrix, which is like the operator, the model of the operator times the inverse of this transform, uh, which you may have heard as the restricted isometry property. If that matrix fulfills the conditions given by the theory, then you have that solving this uh, L1 regularized uh, uh, penalization here will be equivalent to solving some other, which is the L0. So basically that is the concept of sparsity. So, it's very technical, but the, the main point is, if you solve with this L1 and uh, you have some kind of conditions, you will recover the sparsest vector uh, X there that represents uh, the signal. Um, so based on that, people started to use this, this different formalism of sparsity, and this, again, gave uh, uh, significant improvement in image reconstruction capacity. The next step is, okay, uh, enter machine learning. And you say, but I have pairs of data, like I have measurements and I have ideal reconstruction. So the easiest way in medical image to think about it is, okay, you, you run a scan uh, in MRI, you oversample in K-space, you have the patient there for hours and hours and hours and then you do the reconstruction with that data. And then either you take the same patient and do a much shorter scan, or you basically throw away half of the data or uh, like seven eighths of the data and you try to reconstruct from that uh, smaller subject. And then you, you try to learn how to go from one to the other, okay? And 
I mean, there are different degrees of how much you can use this data. So you can, for example, say, I'm going to be reconstructing my, my images with this technique or with this technique. Uh, but I know that, for example, my model of the operator, there are some things that happen in the physics that I don't really know how to measure those parameters, so I need some calibration. And I'm going to use these pairs of data to learn those parameters. So like to choose the parameters that seem to be working best in the data that I get. That, or this lambda parameter that I told you it was hard to choose in, in the classical image reconstruction techniques there, but it's also hard to choose in the second generation. Okay, So maybe by having a set of training data that is representative of all the patients I'm ever going to get into the scanner, uh, I can choose the best lambda for this population. And at least there, I'll, I'll be sure that it's not something I chose manually by playing around. You can go further and say, no, no. I mean, there was this transform that we needed in the previous steps in which first we wanted something to make the image look good. And in the second generation, we wanted something that uh, compressed as much as possible the coefficient of the image. Uh, but we were choosing it by hand. So it's uh, hand design engineering. It's you incorporate your prior knowledge as an, uh, as an expert engineer and you say, I'm going to choose this. Uh, but wouldn't it be better to have a huge data set and learn, like, for example, what is the L that compresses most of the images I'm actually observing? But you can also go further and say, OK, and why, you, why would you restrict yourself to this type of regularization? Maybe you can learn a whole function that this, this regularization cost and, and just from the data choose the regularization cost that, that makes most reconstructions the best possible. Or you can go further and say, yeah, just forget about image reconstruction algorithms and the research of the last <laughs> 100 years and just put something that learns how to go from measurements to images, forget about the physics, forget about the design of the instrument, like just learn everything. All of those approaches that I'm saying are not random examples. It's things that people have used and some of them give huge improvements. Some of them uh, have obvious challenges, but well. So now let's get into the core of, the, of what I want to tell you about. So there's this paper, 2020, uh, Proceedings National Academy of Science, uh, some mathematicians in the UK that analyze what's happening with methods like this. So this is nature paper, uh, very flashy. You give me complex sensor data, and I'm just going to give you images. And everything in between is something I'm just learning. So. It's something I'm going to learn from a data set of pairs of measurements and perfect reconstructions. Uh, how? Well, I mean, I'm not going to get into the details of convolutional neural networks, but what is clear here is that the sizes of the different matrices that are needed in between here don't scale really well. So when this says n squared or n squared times n squared, it's n to the power of fourth, and this n is the number of measurements. So this quickly uh, goes out of, of bounds. It's huge. Um, and then uh, what does this imply, right? I mean, besides the fact that it, in, in the paper, it only worked in really, really small images, like uh, I don't remember now the size, but it, it was not a practical case. It was more a proof of concept. And there was no analysis of whether that could actually scale to a, a real application, which it can't. Uh, besides that, what, what does it mean? It means that we really don't care about MRI physics any longer. We don't care about whatever physics we're dealing with. We're just throwing that away, pretending we don't know anything about the measurements, and just trying to get the image out of, of them. So does this seem reasonable to anyone? Like, why? then why, why do we even design an instrument to be nice? We can just, you know, give random pictures and, and expect it to, like, 
take a few pictures of with a camera of a patient and hope that we will be able to see what's inside the patient, right? Uh, but what the mathematician's paper was about was, okay, if I carefully choose small perturbations of increasing strength of the measurement data, like so, which basically, or of the image actually, which basically it's very hard to see at naked eye. Um, and I do the measurements with these really tiny variations in the image data. And I apply this state of the art compress sensing second generation methods. They almost don't get affected by it. But if I put it into this crazy network, and again, I don't want to think that I don't know, don't want to make you think that everything in machine learning is as crazy as that. There are many, many reasonable approaches. This is something that is at the extreme right of that arrow I drew in the previous slide. Uh, and well, when when you do apply those tiny variations, you completely break the reconstruction. But that's not even the most concerning result they have, because here at least you are able to see that this is about reconstruction. And if you were in the clinic, you would just throw it away and take another scan or whatever, or use another reconstruction method. Uh, but there are also some examples in which the image looks good, but something pops in in the image that wasn't there. So you can create fake tumors, you can create any kind of disturbance that has been seen in the training database, you can make it appear in the reconstruction. So this is of heavy concern. And this, this is what made everyone think, what have we done with image reconstruction over the last time? Because how come our nature published method is doing this thing, right? Actually, since the livelihood of many people working in image reconstruction depends on these things, then people that would be characterized as people supporting this uh, switch to deep neural networks or third generation methods reacted to this and said, okay, let's try to do the same thing with the sparsity based things. And I would like to tell you that they didn't succeed, but well, <laughs> they have some, some results here. I, I'm not gonna get into the specifics. The, the thing is they add some noise and they see how the reconstruction error changes. And TV here is what most people would say is the representative, uh, the representative uh, method based on compress sensing. So it's, you try to make sparse the, the gradient of the image, which in the end means that you're trying to find sort of piecewise constant images so that you get clearly defined regions in different areas of the image. Uh, and of course, they had to choose these, these perturbations very smartly, but this is the same the mathematician had done with their method, so why not? Uh, and basically, you see that their point here was making like, OK, if I add Gaussian noise, like normal noise that is not tailored to break your thing, uh, TV is worse than neural network, so these other lines are different neural network approach to image reconstruction, of course, much smarter than the one I showed in the previous slide. Um, but if I add also like, uh, like noise that is specifically targeted to break your thing, uh, I can also get yours to break at the same rate as mine. So, I mean, it's fair, it's a complaint, it's leveling the field. What does it mean uh, to be stable? Now here we will need a, an actual definition. So here I put like stability of a reconstruction will mean continuity of the solution. So I introduce some changes in the measurements and I look at how much my reconstruction based on those measurements changes. Okay. So for us, this was pretty scary because it's okay. Like there's some theory that says this shouldn't happen. How is it happening? I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, here is another paper, again, the same type of point. So uh, they design different noises that are targeted to break one method or the other, and they see how all methods perform against those noises. So when this is when they design uh, 
a method to to break uh, I, there I have the colors so when design a, a method to break TVs type what happens when anyway I'm not gonna get into the specifics of the work um, but I'm gonna say okay we needed some theory to answer these questions so what we did was take a step back and say the the group has been doing this for for a while actually and and the thought is okay let's rethink what we did uh, and actually one of the things uh, that has always been a goal is okay we've we've put these optimization out problems on the discrete variables that we were storing and we were trying to solve for those discrete variables right but I told you at the beginning, we're actually interested in a continuous domain thing, which is this S that was in this finite uh, energy space of signals. Now we, we go more even general and we say, okay, let's call it F and it belongs to something we're called X prime. So it's a very general context uh, for representing things, volumes versus time, whatever thing you want to reconstruct. Uh, actually, it's a technical point. It's a reflexive Manax space again so I it's a weird compromise I'm making here I'm saying reflexive Manax space which doesn't tell much to something who doesn't know and actually to those who know our setup is actually more general so just go to the paper if, if you're curious um and anyway so we have some objects we want to recover just let's abstract what that means then we have some measurements so that hasn't changed uh we have a forward model. So this plays the role of the H before. Uh, so it's something that takes us from this abstract object in, in this space X prime into a vector in RM to the measurement. And we have some data fidelity terms. So this was the, before it was Y minus HS squared. Now it's some function, we leave it open. And we have some penalization. This substitutes the regularization term that we had before. That is a, some function psi of the norm of this f. So it's so like we measure the size of this f in the specific setup of x prime, and then we penalize it according to some increasing function called psi. So this is extremely general. And why do we look at it in this in this setup? So. The important point is that we're we're doing this in the original continuous domain space, wherever the thing we want to recover lives. And the thing is, if we name f y the reconstruction that you get for a specific set of measurements y, it turns out that it has a finite dimensional expression. It's much nastier than it was before, but there's a finite set of coefficients that solves the finite infinite dimensional problem there based, of course, on the bunch of technical conditions that I have somehow summarized in those red bullet points to the left. So why do we care to do it in this more general setup? Because first, it's the true setup in which we're working, right? So what we want to recover is a continuous domain thing. And second, because actually, when I formulate the problem like this, if I choose an X prime that corresponds to one of the finite dimensional things that I was dealing with before, it also works. So the mathematics are more generic and they allow me to prove results in, in a, that, that apply to the particular cases that I was studying before. Okay? So anyway, <laughs> infinite dimensional settings with exact discretization. There's a weird thing here that is going to bother us because you remember that before we had Fy or F written as a sum of coefficients times basis, times, times basis functions. But here we have the same thing inside, which actually these basis functions inside, interestingly, are the components of the forward model. So they're related to somehow your device, the device you're using to take the measurement. But then there's this nasty guy, which is a nonlinear function that is called duality map. So in general, this is not going to boil down to be the sum of coefficients time functions. It's going to be sum of coefficients time functions pass through some nonlinear map that we sometimes know, sometimes don't know. I know this setup maybe doesn't tell you much, but it covers most of the, or actually all of the cases used in practice. 
And the choice of regularization that we spoke about before becomes the choice of this space X prime and this space X, which are related. Okay, so what can we do with this? We first uh, go back to the classical image reconstruction setup in which we had, remember, the penalization with the two norm at, as a regularizer. So if you do that choice, it corresponds to choosing X as a Hilbert space, which me then means that this nonlinear, nasty nonlinear map, it's linear. So that means that you can actually write, again, the solution as a finite dimensional combination of functions. And these functions are, are very concrete. They're just the duality map applied to the measurement vectors, which depending on your take on functional analysis, that means that they're actually the measurement uh, vectors. So this result is quite well known. It's like when you have to of regularization, so L2 penalized regularization, your solution is going to be a linear combination of the measurement vectors. Think about it how you will. That's why it typically was uh, left behind when, when sparsity came along, because this looked like, okay, really, what you can reconstruct will always have the shape of your measurement vectors, because that's what penalizing in that way means. Anyway, we're now interested in stability. So I'm going to choose the easy case. So I'm basically choosing those functions so as to get back to the problem we had at the beginning. And then the cool thing is you get a closed form solution. Again, this is well known. Close, closed form solution for the coefficients that will lead to the optimal f. Okay? You plug that in <laughs> into the, this norm, like this is the difference between the reconstruction with measurements y and the reconstruction with measurement y1 and reconstruction with measurements y2. And then you do some matrix algebra. It's an easy one for those interested. So you basically plug that expression uh, there, exactly. And you get the y1 minus y2. Anyway, you can diagonalize all the matrices in the middle. And in the end, you get that you can bound the difference in between the reconstructions with the difference between the measurements. So this is what's called Lipschitz continuity of the solution map. So we have some kind of stability in Tikhonov regularization. So at least we've saved the first image reconstruction method from the, the course of being broken by the small noises. And we can actually predict very accurately what will happen if we do include small noises. So actually the blue line is the predicted effect by this bound that I just arrived, and the uh, box plot is actually small experiments with a, this is a toy example, it's a very small dimensional optimization problem, but it basically shows that the theory and the practice sort of go hand in hand. So now let's go for sparsity-based reconstruction and, and try to understand what was happening, okay? Uh, because I mean, we've been, as image reconstruction people, we've been selling in, like sparsity-based image reconstruction for a long time. And now there's some couple of papers that actually show that, okay, you can disturb it pretty easily. And the, the thing here is that the, uh, before getting into the details of what I'm showing you, I, I tell you the main point, which is people have been using sparsity-based image reconstruction in ways that went beyond what the theory covered. Like most practical cases that people have been interested to use didn't actually fulfill this restricted isometry property that, that basically gave you all the theory. And then it kind of worked, but then all the properties that we knew that would hold in theory were not guaranteed. Okay, so a bit more in detail, for those who want to know, this is the typical picture that you get when someone is trying to explain why L1 minimization, like penalizing with this norm with equal one, is a good idea. Okay, this is not exactly the optimization problem that you end up solving, but it resembles it and it's mathematically equivalent. So basically, if you take the measurement vector to be this, and you say I'm getting this measurement here, and you say, okay, I'm going to pick within an area around the measurement, I'm going to pick the guy that has the minimum 
norm with p equal to or p equal one, which would represent this taken off classical ruralization versus sparsity versus ruralization, you'll get those two points. So the round circle is the norm, unity norm for the L, L2 norm, and, and you will get this point. While this, like this kind of square uh, is the uh, one ball for the L1 norm. And there you get a sparse solution. And this happens sparse in the sense that F1 is going to be positive and F2 is going to be zero. So you, you'll have the least amount of coefficients that are not zero. Um, and this goes well as long as the properties are fulfilled. But then look at this other case in which somehow the measurement vector and the boundary of the L1 ball has, have not aligned as we would like them to. And suddenly there are many, many different solutions that minimize the L1 norm subject to the constraint. And this happens more and more as the dimension of the example grows and the dimension of the measurements doesn't grow as fast, which is the, the case in which we work, right? We have some relatively small dimension of the measurements compared to what we want to reconstruct. So this is a unique sparse solution versus a set of solutions with sparse extremes, but that is not what compressing was designed to do. But it is the regime in which most of us have used it for image reconstruction. So stability, yeah, if you're there. So there's a one of the fundamental papers of compressing that was the step that most people wanted to see done before they actually used it shows that you have stability, but you have to be in that case in the left. If you're in the case in the right, you're on your own. And which because actually their stability is not even well defined. If you solve the same problem with different methods, you'll get different solutions because all that line is equally valid solutions according to the problem you're trying to solve. So that we've covered sparsity with image reconstruction. What did we actually do? So these are our results that I'm not gonna get on how we show them, just state them. So what we did was take this thing that was the common factor between L1 and L2, which is LP to the P. And in basically in this abstract domain is choosing this X prime, the LP of omega and this increasing function of the norm there. And we looked at the continuum from P equal one, which we know that if it's finite dimensional and there's a unique solution, we will have stability passing through P equal two, where we have the taken off result that we showed in the previous slide and all the way to P infinity. And look at that continuum and say, where do we have stability and of which type? So long story short, we have bounds for the different regimes. In the first regime, the bound is local. So it will work around some set of measurements, Y1, Y2, but you have to pick a, a local bound, a local space of measurement or local uh, set of measurements in which then you get this number and the bound will work. So you will have some kind of stability. And on the right hand side, we have some other type of stability that is called holder stability, which is a bit more of the same concept. But here you have that the norm in the right depends on the P. So as P grows, this bound becomes less relevant because, well, <laughs> because it does. Um, so yeah, that's what I prepared for you today. And I hope you've gotten some good thoughts based on it. And thank you for your attention. Uh, so, Bina has gone, so if you have any questions. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to. I have a question. Yes. Okay. Um, the question is the following. Did someone already try to do the same as your picture? You see the one with, um, with the square and for the little L1 norm. Uh, yeah, that, that one with the little LP norm with P less than one. I guess it's bad conditioned uh, at the level of numerical analysis, but 
Maybe. Yeah, so what, what you're asking basically, can I break LP with P between one and two in this way? And the answer is no. So that's why we like to look at it. If, if the P is 1.01, it will bend the bit around here mm -hmm. and then you will have a unique solution. So that's actually why we looked at P between one and two because, okay, this breaks P equal one, but it doesn't break P1001. Like the moment you get away from one infinitesimally, you're, you solve the problem in terms of uniqueness of the solution. And there now we show that actually in terms of stability too. <laughs> um, okay. So we cannot do anything for P between zero and one. No, P between zero and one. Like, so the, the compressed sensing theory gives you this link between P equal zero and P equal one upon this uh, nice condition. Uh, but between zero and one, we haven't studied it because basically it gets just more messed up. P equal one is already messed up. You don't have a unique solution in these cases. So then it's, it's not even worth to, to look at what stability means in those cases. No, okay, okay. Uh, fine, but I, my question was far more general. Did anyone study the case between P and, for P between zero and one? For the uniqueness of the solution, I guess there is no, no uniqueness, or yeah. I mean, there, there you can see basically that the problem is non-convex. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you expect it to not have a unique solution. I, I don't, I cannot give you the conditions in which it will have or not have a unique solution because we haven't studied that. Uh, but, but even if it has a unique solution, it will be very hard to solve. Yeah. In a sense I that Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. It's a more general question. Uh, what What do you think will be like the um, the 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 fourth generation? Then it seems like you you say that uh, the second one is still out. The sparsity is still outperforming the the third. No, no. Like, like like the generations are ordered because the third, as much as I think some of the methods in there are dangerous, they beat the hell out of the second generation. So that's why engineers are moving towards there because it works best in most conditions. But then it has this kind of weird problems. When you want to mess it up, you can mess it up. So. And a combination of both, you see? That's, that's like the, the, re, the methods in the third generation that we develop are typically a combination of second and third. So as to typically what we would do is in order to incorporate the physics in the method, we, we have a first step, which would be a classical, a first generation method that has a lot of smoothness and maybe artifacts that you don't want in the image. And then you would use a third generation to fix those artifacts. So actually the most, uh, well, a, a paper in 2016 in the lab that was won several prizes and is very heavily cited is the first that did just that, like think of third generation methods as just as a cleanup of a first generation method. And then, yeah, but that, that's the fun thing. You can now grab little pieces of first, second and third and then mix them up and see that's where the, I think the, and in terms of fourth generation, it's, it's impossible to tell. Like, I mean, <laughs> I don't have the vision at that. <laughs> Any other questions? Can I ask something similar actually? Thank you, Paul. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Very nice uh, talk, very super cool actually. I've learned a lot. And in, in line with this question that was just asked now, so what you would then recommend, because you are saying something like maybe the optimal is to start with a classical inverse problem formulation and solving and then use the more machine learning line to clean up. But ideally, you would really like to leverage both, right? So what, what yeah. would be, in your opinion, the optimal setting? So, or, or, okay, let me ask differently. So which would be your advice on how to use machine learning to help on a well-founded physical problem that we know the acquisition model and so on? So you would see yeah, so it's more the... about Lambda. It's more about just using it for regularization. What is the more winning or optimal setting? I mean, the, the, the strategies that are successful, as far as I know, uh, 
And unless dangerous is the ones that definitely incorporate the physics. If, if you're throwing away any physics that you know, I think it's a very bad idea. But this is very uh, fluffy. I cannot tell you like uh, something mathematical about it. Um, then, I mean, what, what we're trying with Kai is one of, of the ideas, right? So you know that uh, in the case of super resolution, right? You want, yeah. you know For that- For instance, <laughs> randomly. <laughs> you, you know that, that you have like a, a very good uh, resolution here and you know how to model the bad resolution you have in another axis. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna like imitate that, that disturbance and I'm gonna try to fix it with machine learning. Uh, and that is a very controlled environment in which you use, use the power of, like the thought is always the same, use the power of neural networks, but sort of limit their influence on, on your actual answer. Uh, and in that setup, which I mean, there are many different strategies. I think I have uh, like, yeah, in the, in the tutorial I referenced in the middle of the talk, there's uh, many more detailed lists of successful examples. And in the ICAS tutorial by Mikael uh, that we have in the CIBM channel actually, uh, towards the end, he has this region where he he explains what he thinks intuitively are the good paths to follow mm -hmm. uh, to incorporate machine learning. But it's a difficult question. I mean, I I don't know because it it gets a bit away of what I like of being able to show that what I'm saying is true. It's more of a a palate thing. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Are there any other questions? So I will reappear into this. <laughs> any other questions from the audience? If not, thank you, Paul, for a great talk. And uh, you know, it's always uh, close to my heart because uh, this is what I did my PhD in something in reconstruction. So thank you very much. Thank you.